Hello and welcome to the first episode of Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Kayla, and each episode I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of a top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. This week, we're joined by Joel Butterly, co-founder and CEO of Ingenious Prep, to talk about the current state of college admissions. Hi, Joel. Thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. So, Joel, you're the co-founder and CEO here at Ingenious Prep. Could you give me a a little overview of what Ingenious Prep uh, is and what we do here? Sure. Um, Ingenious Prep is an uh, admissions counseling company um, that focuses on not so much just helping students with their application, but also on uh, helping students uh, garner the experiences that will ultimately make them a successful applicant. Um, So that means starting a little bit earlier and working on things like extracurricular activities and leadership opportunities and summer planning. Um, So you founded this company in 2013 while you were still uh, in law school at Yale. What motivated you to create a service that helped students get ready for and apply to college? Um, there were there were a few things. I mean, one of them was that, candidly, law was not the right path for me. I wasn't uh, super fond of becoming a lawyer, um, and I figured that out more or less within the third day of orientation at law school. So it was a kind of jarring realization. Um, as it relates to sort of this industry, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting was that, unlike test prep, which in the 1980s was kind of this cottage industry um, that was deeply fragmented, but was eventually consolidated by these large education companies like Kaplan and Princeton Review. Admissions consulting looked a lot like test prep in the 80s, where there was a a very high number of very small companies servicing a very small number of clients charging what I thought to be prohibitive rates. Um, And so the idea of of the company was to create a model that through use of our own kind of proprietary curriculum and a slightly more efficient Uh, service delivery method, meaning essentially remote service delivery. Um, We would be able to create a a scaled organization that would have the same effect on uh, same effect on admissions consulting that companies like Kaplan and Princeton Review had on test prep. Many people don't really realize the difference, which is that 20, 30 years ago, almost nobody could afford test prep, and now it's almost ubiquitous. Um, And uh, hopefully the same thing happens with admissions consulting. Right. I think the industry definitely has changed a lot over the years, especially from the 70s and 80s until now. But just in the time since you started the company back in 2013, how do you think the admissions industry or just college admissions in general have really changed throughout the years? Um, So the industry has changed a fair amount insofar as it is a little bit more commonplace now. Um, It was still pretty rarefied and not many people knew that the industry even existed when we started. I think that today more people are aware of it. I think that that's really only true kind of on like the East and West Coast, I think sort of in the entire middle of the of the country. Most people are not aware that these kinds of services exist or what value they can bring. Um, admissions itself changes more or less gradually. I mean, occasionally you'll hear announcements that make it seem like there's some sort of sea change in admissions. They're normally kind of red herrings. Um, for, the, for the most part, admissions changes every year insofar as it just becomes more competitive the standards get higher, it's more difficult for students, and that will almost certainly continue to be the case. And if you had a prediction or an idea into why that is, why college keeps getting more competitive, why it seems to be more and more important for high school students to go to college every year? Um, There's a few reasons. One of them is that you have more people in fewer spots, which is the reality of population growth and not having a commensurate growth in uh, you know, college spots. Um, so the number of spots at Harvard, as far as I know, have been the same for the last decade, but obviously the population of applying students has grown considerably. Um, so it's not like a currency where things adjust with inflation. Um, these spots stay the same, number of people applying increases, therefore the admissions rate goes down. I think the second component to that is the relationship between uh, kind of uh, your mobility in society and the school that you went to um, continues to strengthen to some degree. Um, It seems to be the case that as the economy itself becomes more competitive, and it is definitely becoming much more competitive, and is certainly more competitive for our generation than it was for our parents' generation, the need to have 
you know, this sort of top tier education becomes, um, you know, ever more important. So I think that from that perspective, it's not just so much that there are fewer spaces and more people, but also that those people have a greater desire to attend them because it is uh, of intrinsic value to their life goals. Right. And speaking of, you know, a top tier education, I think as college admissions get more competitive and people are looking for a leg up in the job industry and going and doing interviews and applying to their first jobs out of college, Mm -hmm. people are really focused on those top 10 universities, those Ivy Leagues. Mm -hmm. How do you think that affects admissions and what are your thoughts on rankings and importance for applying to college in general? Um, Well, I think that people generally really misunderstand rankings. Like if you actually, I mean, so the, the sort of Benchmark is the U.S. News and World Report, which is what everybody's referring to when they refer to the rankings. Um, and if you actually look at those rankings and look at the individual variables that they're using, you start to find a lot of things there that most people don't care about. Like, I, I don't know many candidates who'd say, like, oh, I really want to go to this school because they have well, uh, well-funded well Ph.D. programs. Like, why would that be a part of your consideration for which uh, undergraduate school you go to? Or why would it be an important consideration? Um, average teacher pay, average teacher tenure, things like that are big parts of how these schools are ranked, um, but fundamentally do not form a, an important part of a student's opinion about the school. So I think that the rankings themselves are of only limited utility. Um, they, they are of more utility when you think about them more as a proxy for how the economy is going to value your degree. So to the extent that employers care a great deal about them, it makes sense that students would care a great deal about them. Um, because uh, aside from the educational value of a college degree, they're also extremely valuable from an employment standpoint. Um, I think that students tend to overemphasize the ranking, the overall ranking of university versus its ranking in a specific area. So I'll often tell students that, you know, UIUC is a school that has one of the best computer science programs in the country. Yale is one of the most reputable and well-known schools, but does not have a particularly reputable computer science program. If you know that you want to be a computer scientist or a coder or, you know, software developer or whatever, um, there's a very good argument for you going to UIUC over Yale. You'll almost certainly get a better degree, and, and employers will know that the value of that degree from UIUC is extremely valuable. Um, so I would encourage people to think more about, in terms of ranking, think more about the ranking of the school for your particular areas of interest. Um, and also understand, of course, that ranking is one in kind of a, a whole variety of things that you're considering. Um, it is by no means the be-all, end-all of, of sort of, of, of how you choose. Right. And ranking definitely changes over the years, too. If you look back just at the past 10 years, the ranking of the top 10 has fluctuated greatly. Yeah. um, I mean, you can kind of rig the rankings um, if you're a school. So um, and some schools have. Um, I think that schools that have done a particularly good job moving up in ranking or or, uh, in rankings are uh, Duke um, and UChicago, um, which is when I was applying, which wasn't that long ago, um, I guess a little over 10 years ago now, um, we're not in the top 10. Um, and we're not considered sort of on par with the Ivy League schools and are now, I think Duke is eight and UChicago is three, or maybe that was last year. Um, part of the way that you do that is by accepting students with aberrantly high test scores and grades because that affects the, the average admitted students' grades and test scores, and that in turn affects the, the overall rankings. Um, so they've done actually a very good job of that. Um, I think that rankings tend to even themselves out over time. So if you were to look at rankings over the course of 20 or 30 years, what you'll find is that there are schools that are perennially in the top 10 or top 15. There are schools that make an appearance and then disappear. Um, So it is, in my opinion, quite likely that although Duke is a world-class institution, it will not likely be in the top 10 um, for the long term. UChicago will probably drift more towards 10 than it is then then at three. Um, So I think that one reason that this is important is that if you're a student who cares a great deal about, about rank, it's probably that you care about rank in part because you think that the broader community cares about rank. So you also need to think about sort of your time there as an investment and whether or not that investment is going to increase in value or devalue. So since I went to Dartmouth, it's fallen three or four spots in the rankings. I don't personally care, but that would be a good example of a, of, of a, of a ranking devalue since I've, since I've attended. Um, it's worth considering. Um, I don't think, again, I, you know, I don't want to make it seem like ranking is by any means the most important thing. It most certainly isn't. Um, but for those of people who care, it's worth considering that they actually do change year to year. And actually, if you're thinking about an individual school, you should look at the, the trend over time. Right. And I think for particular programs, if you're looking for schools with the best ranked engineering program, that's probably less likely to change as much throughout the years. It's less likely for a program to suddenly get worse. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. The, 
the individual departments are ranked that way in part because of the faculty they have and the quality of the facilities they have. Those things are, are uh, slightly more immutable. Um, uh, you know, you can make a huge investment, like Yale School of Management is a good example of a school that made a huge investment in its facilities and then skyrocketed in the rankings in the, in the subsequent years. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. Um, so I think that looking at the, the rankings of the individual departments is more indicative of the quality of education, yes. Right. And speaking of fluctuations and really changing over the years, obviously, like we've talked about, college admissions has really changed. So as someone that is deeply in this industry and really looking at these trends, what would your predictions be for the next 10 years, say, of how college admissions are going to change? So there's an inherent tension in in admissions um, in higher education that, that isn't really spoken about enough, I think, and it's between the tension between customization and standardization. So the more you standardize a process, um, in, in theory, the more accessible it becomes. So it's the thought behind the standardized tests was that it would, it would be a boon to students coming from less privileged backgrounds because they would all be competing on sort of an even, an even level. Um, on the other hand, you have customization, things like the common application, which is highly customizable. Um, another example would be the ill-fated coalition application, um, which was completely customized and was like built over you know years and years. And the, the thing about those highly customized applications is that they benefit students who have the resources to pay for guidance, um, who have the time and the, the mental space to, to devote to those kinds of things. And so customization aims at, generally speaking, when you hear about customized applications, what they're trying to do is be accurate with their admissions decisions. They're trying to accurately record a student's merit for the purposes of admissions. But the difficulty is that as soon as you make it more customized, the students who are less privileged aren't able to record themselves as well. Um, so that's, that's, that's one problem. And then on the standardized side, you, you give access to students who are less privileged, but simultaneously your measurement is less accurate because it's all standardized. You're not picking up on the nuances of students and it makes the actual institution of admissions much more difficult um, to, 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 to handpick. So I'm not so, so sure that I see a direction a consistent direction either way. The coalition application pitched itself as highly customized and giving access to students. I think that there will be more efforts like that, where it's where it's sort of like, oh, this is to help uh, make admissions more accurate. Um, and what we'll find is that making it more accurate means that it makes it more exclusive. Um, not because the underprivileged students don't have merit, but because in a more accurate application inherently benefits those who can pay for the assistance necessary to, to kind of shine on, on those application procedures. Um, I think we'll go back and forth there. So that, that's one kind of metric that I see as as driving changes in admissions. And again, I don't think it's going to go in one direction or the other. I think it'll sort of pinball between them. Um, and we'll probably end up with more or less the system we have now, which I think is maybe the best compromise um, that I've that I've seen. Uh, the other thing is sort of money in admissions, generally speaking. Um, I think that the recent scandal sort of opened up the question of what role should money play in admissions. And I think that as a country and society, we did a very bad job dealing with that question because all we really did was agree, all right, you shouldn't be able to pay off a coach and cheat your way in. What we didn't actually address is, is it okay if somebody spends $5 million to get their kid into Harvard? Is that is, is the benefit that inures, to the, that inures to the other Harvard students or the fact that it can subsidize students who don't have money, is that worth it? Um, I don't have a clear opinion on that, but I think that it's a decision, a, a conversation that we need to have and have it. Um, and so I think that for that reason, we're likely to have a whole nother round of controversy around, well, this family paid that amount of money. And some people will say, well, it's worth it for all the other students who benefit from it. It's worth it for one spot. And everybody else will say, but it tar you know, tarnishes the, the kind of idealism of the institution. And I think both are good points. Right. And I think we're definitely already seeing that weighing between, you know, schools wanting more diversity and um, trying to have schools more accessible to students. If you look at um, the SAT adversity score, for example, that just recently changed to the landscape, um, you can already see companies kind of trying to weigh that right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a bit cynical about all of these things. It seems to me that oftentimes what you, what you see are things that look like they're paying lip service to good social causes, but don't actually have the, the legs to make it because it just didn't make sense. Uh, it was It was not... The, it was like, we're doing this for a good reason, okay, that's great. And then like, and here's a plan that seems to bear no relationship whatsoever to our end goal. Um, and uh, that's not the first time they've done it. Um, so they, they do this, I think, in part to 
um, sort of stay up to date on like social trends, but they tend to do it so poorly that things rarely change at all. Um, so, so that is, I think, a deeply cynical perspective, but it seems to be pretty accurate based on like the last decade of experiences. Right. And then jumping back to what you mentioned of the college admissions scandal that mm -hmm. has been um, very much in the spotlight of news recently. Mm -hmm. So recently this year, it came out that several parents paid coaches, um, paid other specialized services to help their children get into top colleges. Mm -hmm. So you already mentioned that you know money is a very big issue yep. in college admissions, but what do you think really led to these scandals coming out now? Uh, I mean, what led to it coming out was that there was a father of, I believe, a Yale student who was being investigated for insider trading or some other securities-related scam, um, and he basically, uh, you know, told told federal investigators about this in order to deflect attention from himself. Um, I mean, that's 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 the that's the sort of short part. I mean, the longer part is that as a society, we are in the midst of a deep, deep polarization about the the nature of socioeconomic imbalance and how how permissible it is and how much is permissible. Um, and something like this, which is just such such an egregious uh, you know initiative on behalf of the of the those who already have every advantage, um, was just sort of like salt in the wound. It's like not even our institutions of higher learning um, can accurately reflect the merit of the underprivileged. It, ha it, it is corrupted. Um, which is very unfortunate. I think that the other kind of part here, which is just sort of a very practical element, which is that these schools basically blindly gave coaches the ability to induct students into their ranks. Um, and so if you have a, a you know athletic coach who's making forty or fifty thousand dollars a year and they have complete and utter control over a over let's call it an asset that somebody's willing to pay half a million dollars for, it's a matter of time. Um, and so I think that the I was not surprised at all that that's how people how that's that was was working. I had long suspected that somebody would eventually figure that out, um, and so it wasn't wasn't surprised at all. Um, but uh, no, it was it was uh, you know profoundly disappointing. Um, I think, um, and I assume, assume schools will be more careful now with uh, with athletic recruiting. Right, and we've definitely seen a lot of schools respond by doing their own internal investigations and being more cautious, even with parents donating to the schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and now a lot of the parents are in court being um, processed through the court system. Yep. Um, so what do you think the future of this scandal is? Do you think it's going to continue? Yeah, um, so um, so a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, people misunderstand the, the nature of, of the criminal case. Um, so they think of it as these people cheated other students, other applicants. That is not at all the legal standing. Um, uh, what, what actually happened is that these individuals, the, the, the parents and the coaches, misappropriated property that belonged to the school. It is the school's right to dispose of those spots how they want. They can sell them, they can give it to the student with most merit, they can give it to any student that they want. Um, so it really, people tend to focus on the effect that this had on other students. I would say that this did not have a net impact on other students any, any more or any probably not as not as large an impact as donations institutional advancement the sort of traditional backdoor into um into these institutions um that's not to say that it's not bad it's terrible it's just that the reason that these people are being prosecuted is because they stole from the school not from other students so the scandal will continue it will continue in, under different terms and that those different terms are not is it okay to bribe a coach which everyone agrees of course it is not is, is it okay to donate 10, 15, 20 million dollars to one of these elite institutions and thereby gain entry for a student who is wholly undeserving of that spot based on the benefits that it that it confers to other students. Um, and I, again, I don't know the answer to it. I can promise that the wrong way of dealing with it though is the way that colleges are dealing with it, which is to not talk about it. I mean, the best way of doing it is like, hey, we're gonna take three students donating this much money. This is how we're gonna use the money. Uh, it's gonna benefit all these other students um, and some people won't like it, some people will be fine with it, and other people will love it. But not talking about it means that invariably this, the next round will be treated with much more, I think, rage, um, and it will be targeted at the institutions. It won't be targeted at, like, individual thieves. Right, because I think it has been kind of an unspoken truth for a long time that certain people will donate 
lots of money to certain institutions mm -hmm. to make sure their child gets in, and that is technically a legal way. But do you think, so in the future, you think that this will be what comes under more scrutiny? Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, and I honestly, there are very few people who could answer the question, but the question that I would want to ask is how fiscally essential is it that they take these institutional donors, right? So if, if they were to say, listen, if without these, without these donors, we literally could not give uh, tuition breaks to, to this many students, like this many students who deserve to be here but cannot afford to be here, cannot get an education. Like that's a very, that is a nuanced and interesting ethical debate. Um, the, if they were just like, yeah, we're doing it to like pad the, uh, the endowment, I think people would generally th say that's probably not in keeping with the mission of the institution. Um, but yes, they will come under they will come under more scrutiny, and I think that just as a society, we have to be, you know, reasonable about this. Like that, there there are there is a world in which somebody donating to an institution that benefits a whole bunch of other students is is better than the alternative. Um, that is certainly true, and there are times I'm sure that it happens where it's just egregious. Uh, but keeping it opaque is a bad idea. Right, and as people continue to debate now the price of tuition as well, I think that will also become linked to that issue. Yeah, I mean the the increase in the rise the rise in tuition and student debt is is, I mean obscene. It cannot possibly be explained by anything other than like easy access to debt. Um, if the federal government were like we're going to clamp down on this, and all of a sudden the the pool of people who were able to pay d decreased, I assume that these schools would either give out more scholarships or. Uh, would you know just charge lower tuition but like most of these schools it's not like they certainly the, the ivy league schools and like the schools with the really high endowments which are like u chicago and stanford rice is a big endowment um they don't really need tuition like it's helpful it defrays cost but they don't strictly speaking need it i don't think right so in light of all of these scandals talk about financials and then just how acceptance rates keep decreasing over the years. How is this affecting the individual student who's looking at applying to college now or within the next four years? Um, well, I kind of feel bad for that student, honestly. The, you know, it's like I kind of felt bad for myself when I was applying because that was like the first, that was like in the beginning of the era where everybody was talking about how competitive it has now become. And I think at the time everyone assumed like it couldn't, couldn't get worse. Um, and that's when we were still in like double digit acceptance rates. Um, and it's gotten a lot worse since then. Um, I think that part of the difficulty for a lot of these students now is that the um, the value of those degrees continues to increase, both because they are more scarce and because the economy is more competitive. So in addition to wanting it more and potentially needing it more, um, they will also find it much harder to get. Um, and uh, I guess the advice that I would give to every student is that fundamentally what these schools are looking for is two things. One of them is students who have let's call it adequate grades and test scores. doesn't mean the best grades and test scores. It means that you've reached a certain level, which you know, we refer to as the threshold level. Um, the other is that they want students who have identified their interests and passions very early and have developed it farther than anyone else. So your goal in high school should be find what I'm interested in, develop it farther than anyone around me and likely any other student applying, and you'll do very well. Um, if you do this sort of like student council and you know a couple, couple of different sports and maybe the robotics club and maybe you play some instruments if you kind of do the dabbling thing where you're good at a lot of things a jack of all trades and master of none um you're gonna struggle a lot there's just too many people like that now right so that's definitely excellent and excellent advice for people that are in high school right now trying to develop their candidacy for people who are applying right now they're working on their common applications right now what would your advice for those students be um, I guess I have a lot, but the, probably the most important one is that you have to be realistic about what other people are writing. I think that everybody assumes that what they're writing is somehow, you know, worlds away from what other people are writing. And the chances are that, I mean, extremely likely that there are, there are, there are a handful of students who are writing nearly the same thing in your school, much less in your region, in your state, or in the country. Um, so I think that you need to spend a good long time thinking about what about me is actually unique? What can I bring to bear in class on campus or as an alum that will be unique or at least very special um, and focus on that. Um, and I think that one way that you figure out how it differentiates you is you've got to spend some time on those schools' websites and see what they're saying about students. What are these students majoring in? What are their academic interests? What are their backgrounds? What states do they come from? What languages do they speak? Um, all that's all those statistics are there um, on the on the websites, and so that's how you sort of identify your differentiating factors. Right. 
And one last piece of advice for the students looking at those top colleges, those IVs. You are an alum of Dartmouth and Yale Law School, mm -hmm. so you've been through it. What are yeah. your advice to those students? Uh, first, don't get attached to any one school. Uh, when I was applying, uh, my dream school was Harvard, um, which I was uh, deferred, waitlisted, and rejected from. Uh, then Yale, which just flatly rejected me. Um, I was fortunate enough to get into Dartmouth and Cornell, um, and then I got off the waitlist at Princeton. Um, I went to Dartmouth for this debate team. Um, I was very disappointed, um, and I shouldn't have been. I think that that was crazy. Um, if I could go back in time, I'd tell them, uh, you know, smack myself and be like, you know, you're, this is this you're incredibly lucky to be where you are. Um, so don't be attached to one school. They're all great schools, and um, and and the chances that you aren't able to find a group of people that you like there, and the resources that you need to succeed there are slim to none. All of them will provide you the platform that you need. It's crazy to think that only one of them would. Um, it, their differences are at the margin. The diff the, at, the, at the fundamental, at the core of it, they have an almost unlimited amount of resources and world-class facilities for a small number of students. So there's there's a lot more in common than there are differences, I think, between them. Um, that's number one. Number two, you don't have to go to an Ivy League school. There's nothing particularly, you know, uh, special about Ivy League. I mean, the Ivy League is fundamentally a um, an athletic conference more than that's that's what it was to begin with it's there's nothing about it that makes it like magical um, there are an, any number of spectacular state schools um, and other private institutions liberal arts colleges that are, you, where you will receive at least as good um, in education and in which your life outcomes are likely to be very similar um, so I think that from almost every perspective putting some sort of specific emphasis on the Ivy League it's just because you think other people will care. There's there is nothing else beyond that. Um, there isn't any. There isn't some super secret Ivy League club where we get together and we're like, now it's time to you know run the economy. It doesn't work that way. Um, so uh, I think those are the two biggest pieces of advice. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think that advice will be really helpful to students in all stages of their application process. My so, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us about those admissions trends. Yep. Thank you. And for more information on those trends, be sure to check out our blog, which is linked in the episode description. There are tons of helpful articles on current trends, college acceptance rates, and top ranked programs. If you have any questions or would like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow and send us a message on social media with the hashtag, hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office. Mm -hmm.